As some of you may know, I was a firefighter paramedic in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for 26 years. And that career began almost 35 years ago, right here at this training facility in this burn building behind me. And over the years, I took a lot of great training classes here, as well as other areas around the country. And some of the greatest training I got was from New York firefighters, firefighters from FDNY. And that is because they really pushed the envelope of techniques, innovation, technology. And so when here a while back, I got to meet one of FDNY's retired chief officers, Tom Dowling, and talk to him about drones. It was really great to see how they had progressed with their drone program. And so come with me as I get to talk to him about how he helped implement drones into the robotics team of FDNY and how they have brought drones into the program for safety and efficiencies for the department, the firefighters, and those that they've sworn to protect. My name is Tom Dowling. I uh, started in this technology probably in 2011. Just caught the bug right away, you know? With the original Phantom, every time DJI released a new drone, there I was. I started in, uh, in public safety and had a 40-year career in public safety. I retired from the New York City Cry Department as a Deputy Chief Information Officer. I helped found the FDMY Robotics Tees. A very gratifying experience in being able to contribute and to have a legacy. You know, the team has just grown by leaps and bounds. And yeah. Under some great tutelage there, like uh, Captain Mike Leo and his team, just amazing people. I came out to retire. I came out to the Vegas Valley, but uh, got involved, of course, with the drone community out here. Retirement's kind of taken a sideline to that uh, because we're always involved putting together a group get together. I just love the technology. I fly my Avadas. I fly Mavics. I fly Airs and Minis. Just love the technology. I don't do it so much commercially anymore that I do it for mental health, to escape, to enjoy. And the nice thing about it is it allows us to explore more of our environment. My wife is my visual observer. We go out, we have a great time, we have an RV, so we'll go out exploring and we'll be able to put up the drone and check out places that normally we wouldn't be able to get to. No, that's fantastic to hear. And how did you get into utilizing drones there at FDNY? What, what was the push? Because like you said, Mike Leo, they've got a great program and you hear the, the starting of that legacy. I was basically the money bags and the political navigator there are so many obstacles in a bureaucracy to deal with. My biggest problem was my peers and my superiors, not understanding how important this technology was. You know, putting firefighters, OVs, outside vent members up on a roof, cutting openings to allow that smoke and the gases and the heat to escape, but not being able to visualize them at the incident command post. Yes. Being able to launch a thermal imaging drone and being able to spot each and every one of them was groundbreaking. Being able to see those heat signatures below the roof line and saying, hey, we got to evacuate that exposure. And then 10, 15 minutes later, a collapse. And you just wound up keeping those spied members off of a memorial wall. Absolutely. You know, it, making sure members go home at the end of their tour was probably the most important thing we could do on the job. Being able to see that just begin to grow and grow over time. Uh, we started from the force protection aspect of it to where it grew to essential in the rescue and on-scene operations. You know yourself from your background, just you can get involved in information overload yes. with everything coming in. But having a, a viable drone team on site with that pilot in charge, with the VO, with the data person, and then the officer who is basically sniping and watching and then conveying that information to the incident commander. What a huge difference that makes in operation. Absolutely. You mentioned, uh, it's something that I talk a lot about is 
before I commit a firefighter to the roof, or now I'm retired, but before I did, or even into a building, I now have more peace of mind of that roof structure being intact. It's a tool, right? And, and that's part of the problems I see today. The desire of certain groups to try to take away these essential tools, regardless of where they are manufactured or built, these are essential tools. To me today, I look at the M30T as one of the best pieces of firefighting gear you can put your hands on. If you take that away, it's like taking away the hearse tool, the jaws of light. I imagine today that the M30T is probably used more often than the hearse tool. Just from the overall data that you can collect from that, you know, how essential that is in that decision-making process. We have to learn how to also, as a result of 9-11, we lost a lot of experience that day and in the, in the months and, uh, and, and years to follow, we spent 25, 30, 35, 40 years on the job, right? Families came back to their loved ones with 25, 30 years on the job and said, hey, you had a close call enough, let's get off the job. And our job became so young so quick. And we lost a lot of top people, you know, our chief of department we lost. We lost so many command chiefs that day. Yeah. And we realized we had to centralize our command back at our fire department operation center. You know the desire of a fire chief is to be on seat. Well, the next best thing is to get them the information yeah. and put them in that virtual environment that they feel like they are on the seat and can still contribute. Yeah, And that went so far on the job, being able to build out a mesh network, putting routers on all our vehicles and being able to make sure we had the pathways to send this data through was so important to us. At the end of the day, making sure members go home at the end of their tour. And I have to say, what really concerns me today is the xenophobic approach that some are taking. We decided years ago to globalize and now we just want to pull that back at the stroke of midnight. And I, I think it puts us all at risk. Uh, you know, I hope there'll be more enlightenment as time goes on. One of my goals with one of my friends, Bob, is to put drones in the hands of politicians. Let them fly, because we all know what happened to us. You know, oh, that first drone we put up, we were like, okay, I'm hooked. The other thing we have to be concerned about here in this country is STEM education. Yes. Okay. There are so many verticals you can leverage from this technology, but are we going to have the expertise in this country to do so? Right. If we don't invest in those kids today. Absolutely. And we're not just talking future pilots. The next designer of the next drone, the software developer, the, the next you know, third-party product that goes to a drone, LiDAR, whatever. That's going to come from them, and we've got to get them interested in this technology. Now. And, they, and they could be in pre-K today. I've seen some great things out here today at the expo. This drone soccer league over there. Yeah. Being able to take these four- and five-year-olds and put a little drone in their hand, you know, and watch them. Because you and I didn't grow up this way. Yeah. Okay? But right. they do. It was funny. When I first handed out uh, iPads to chiefs on the job... Huh. They were like, what am I supposed to do with this? I went, okay, show of hands. How many have uh, kids at home? Half the room. How many have grandkids? The other half. I said, go home this weekend and hand it to them. Let them show you how. Okay? And, you know, now they can't be without them. Absolutely. Right? So we have to evolve that mindset with the kids that are in school today. And we have to contribute to that process. You know, we come before, right? Yeah. And we have to leave something for them. Yeah, uh, probably right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much.